Hi, everybody. Welcome to Discover College Soccer. Today, I'm lucky enough to be joined by Coach Tony McManus from the University of Memphis. Welcome, Coach. Hey, Matt. How are you guys doing? Doing well, thanks. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, love to take some time here and learn some more about the University of Memphis. It's it's more than just Beale Street and uh, and barbecue down, down there. So let's uh, let's get right into it. So let's talk about the recruiting side of things first. You know, I, I guess everybody's curious you know, all the, all the guys out there wanting to go division one, you know, you're, you're approaching on that uh, magic date of June 15th, where you can start talking to players here. So when are you actually starting to look at players uh, and, and kind of get that list going and then how quickly, and what are you trying to do come, come that June 15th timeframe? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, everybody's time frame is going to be different. Uh, and you know, it's, it varies from school to school and there's, there's a lot of different factors that go into that. But with us, typically we will start the recruiting process, uh, when, you know, players are going into early junior year, middle of their junior year, and then carry that through all the way through their senior year. That doesn't mean that we're not looking at it. It doesn't mean that we're not identifying. It doesn't mean that we're, we're not talking to uh, freshmen and sophomores. Uh, but the majority of our recruiting where we're really starting to hone in on, okay, this is a player we really are interested in and we want to move forward with, we don't typically do that until middle to the end of their junior year. And then, again, like I said, all the way through uh, their, their senior year. Okay. Now, in terms of um, going out and looking at players, kind of what what are your must go to events, tournaments, and and places that you're you're going to see players? Man, it has it has really really changed in uh, in recent years. Uh, it is really hard to gauge what event, where to go to to see the the most players that we can possibly see. That, uh, that either fit what we are looking for um, or is regionally uh, going to be feasible for us. Uh, and so we try to do the major events for all the major leagues. Uh, so we'll try to do, you know, a winner, winner showcase for ECNL or MLS Next. And we typically try to do the, uh, the, um, the Southern Regionals and the national championship for USU soccer. Um, and then now with the new E64 league, we'll start doing a lot more with, with that. Um, but we tend to do those major events where, uh, where the, the top teams, top clubs from those different uh, entities are competing against each other. And then, you know, whatever, whatever local regional stuff we can do that is, that's, you know, the states touching Tennessee, uh, the North Carolinas, the Floridas, the Georgias, because those are relatively easy for us to get to and, uh, to and from. Uh, but those, those are kind of the, the main ones. I, I think a lot has changed in the past couple of years uh, with, with showcases. And so, you know, those big major showcase events, the Disney's, uh, you know, the, the blue chip showcases, some of those have, have kind of died down and faded away because most of those different leagues are, you know, just competing it within their own separate leagues. So, um, those are, those are kind of the major ones that we, we do now. And, and how do camps fit into everything, whether that's your own camps or, or your staff, uh, work in other camps, how, how important are camps these days? Uh, camps are important. Uh, we just finished our first ID camp for this, uh, this summer, and we offered four players uh, spots on the team. Three are, um, three are incoming players. One is a, a future. Uh, so for us, it is a major recruiting tool. Um, and I don't want to speak for any other schools. I don't want to speak out uh, against other schools or anything um, because I don't know how everybody runs theirs. Uh, but ours is a ours is a major tool for us, and we we try to keep it manageable as far as numbers are concerned. We don't we don't want to have two and three hundred kids here because we just can't really evaluate fully players, and we can't really get to know 
each player here. So we try to keep the numbers really low to keep them manageable. Uh, and they've, they've been very effective for us as far as our roster breakdown is concerned. So we're, we're happy with them. We like them. Um, and, uh, and obviously very, very important for us. Okay. Now looking at your guys' roster, you guys see you guys got a handful of international players as well. So how does international recruiting kind of fit into the grand scheme of things? Um, it, it's, you know, there's, there's players that, you know, we have relationships with, uh, either coaches overseas, coaches here in the U S or, um, uh, we have relationships with different clubs, uh, or agencies overseas. And so we're always going to take a look at, at the international kid. Uh, but you know, whether it be an international or it be a domestic, it's just whoever fits us the best that's who we want to bring in. So whether it's international or domestic doesn't matter to us. It's just who's going to be the better fit for us. Now, when you talk about fit, you know, what, what does fit to Memphis look like? What are those qualities you're looking for in a player, whether they're on the field or off the field? Well, that's, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, on the field, I think it's important for us to, to find somebody who they're a blue collar player, uh, both in work ethic, both in how they, they approach the game, uh, their professionalism, you know, their, how, how they respond to, you know, ups and downs over the course of a season. Um, those types of things are, are very important to us. Um, then, you know, within our conference, we have an incredibly good, we have an incredibly technical, we have an incredibly fast, we have an incredibly athletic and physical conference. And so, those are some of the key components as far as physical traits that we look for. And then on top of that, we're looking for, for kids who have a good IQ for the, the game. They understand and they can evaluate different things within the game. And then, you know, the, the second part of that, and probably even more important than all of that, is just their character. Uh, and we can see character in games. We can see, you know, when they turn a ball over, when uh, one of their teammates turn a ball over when they get scored on or when something doesn't go their way, a referee makes a bad call and just kind of see how they carry themselves, how, what their reaction is in those moments. Uh, those things matter to us and those, those go a long way. Uh, and then, uh, you know, their, their character off the field. Uh, are they, are they somebody who, are they here for soccer or are they here for the social aspect? Uh, it's, it's important to be a, a, college athlete and it's important to enjoy your college experience but if it comes at the detriment of the team if it comes at the detriment of your development or anybody else's this isn't the right fit for for a player like that so we look out for stuff like that we speak with coaches we speak with other people who know these players so we can really try to uh to get a, a holistic feel for who this player is but we, we don't always get it right. Uh, and, you know, sometimes kids come to college, there's a little bit too much freedom for them. And, you know, they, they you know, find their way out the door. Uh, and so those are, those are, you know, things that happen. But those are, uh, those are things that we try to weed out uh, early on. Okay. Well, you know, I can't uh, let you go without uh, asking about the, the cash side of things, people always wanting to know what's it going to cost and all those sorts of things. But with, but, but, you know, I don't want to get into specifics, but in terms of just the whole academic athletic scholarship mix, um, you know, what, what does that look like at Memphis for, for, let's just say an average recruit coming in? Well, everybody's situation is different. Uh, some of it is based on, you know, what money is available uh, some of it is based on what we see the immediate impact of you being, what we see the long-term impact of you being, as well as financial needs. And, you know, everybody's situation is different. And we try to take that into account when we, we put different packages together. Um, but also knowing that if you're a fully funded Division I program, the most scholarships you can get is 9.9 .9 scholarships. We carry a roster of roughly 30 guys. And so, you know, trying to break up 9.9 .9 scholarships between 30 guys is an incredibly hard task to do, especially given all those different parameters uh, that I just gave you there. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of it is, is, is going to come down to those first couple of traits is, 
you know, what, what do we see your immediate impact being? And, you know, what is, what is your uh, financial needs? Um, and it's not about ego. Uh, you know, if, if, if you want to say and tell your friends and everybody else, I have a full ride scholarship here. And that's what matters more than the product that we can put around you. Then again, this is not going to be the, the right fit. Uh, we try to build a, a core group, a key group of, of guys who kind of fall into those, uh, those needs and then build around them using different areas of academic scholarships, different packages that can be put together uh, using the, uh, the different um, academic components because there is five times as much money in academics as there is in athletics. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's good info. Well, let's talk a little bit more then about the school. Uh, you know, University of Memphis, great city. Uh, it's been too long since I've been there. But what, you know, give me some some inside scoop about the school. What What's some awesome things about it that I'm not going to learn just by clicking around the website? Yeah, there's there's a lot about the the school. It's, um, you know, it's a, it's a great school. It's a great campus. Uh, you know, it's a school of roughly 21,000 undergrad students and about 3,000 grad students. Uh, we do have one of the top business programs in the country. Uh, that is something that, you know, when, when people are going through and looking at different business programs, they're, they're kind of caught off guard by that. But one of the big things that the, the university has is we have three Fortune 500 companies headquartered here in, in Memphis, Tennessee, and all three of them are major uh, players with the University of Memphis, as well as they are there for uh, graduates of the, the different programs here at the University of Memphis. And so these are great opportunities where you, if you are involved in one of these majors that, you know, either AutoZone or International Paper or um, oh, what is the other one? Uh, FedEx, sorry, <laughs> I, I blanked on that one. Um, FedEx, uh, if you are involved in any way, shape or form in some, some fashion that uh, might overlap one of those businesses, uh, you have internships that are, that are available for you, as well as opportunities to, to find work uh, with those companies when you graduate. And so all of them play a major part uh, in that respect, but they also are, are big donors to the University of Memphis. So those are probably things that, that you don't know that much about. Um, the athletics department is, is very good. Uh, you know, our, our basketball team, our football program, uh, we're both top 25 programs this past year. Our women's soccer program is one of the top 25 schools in the country. Uh, you know, we're doing our best to, to get our uh, our program to that level, but athletics in general is, is a very popular, very big thing here. Um, we have different professional organizations here, the Memphis Grizzlies, the Memphis Redbirds, which is a uh, AAA uh, affiliate of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, so a lot of different things going on around the city that's intertwined with the University of Memphis in different ways. Oh, that's great. Um, well, along the academic side of things you know what kinds of uh support mechanisms are there in place to help student athletes you know really balance that school and sport uh push and pull that's always there absolutely and uh and the important thing for everybody to to know is when you go to college if you go to college as a as a athlete uh you are known as a student athlete and student comes before everything else and we can't emphasize that enough because the statistics of players going from just high school to college to, to, to play soccer are so low. And then the, the uh, statistics of players going from uh, collegiate sports into the professional levels is even lower than that. And so you don't want to be unprepared for what the next phase of your life is uh, should your sport not work out. Now we want everybody to, to get an opportunity to play professionally. And we do open a lot of doors. We we've, we've been fortunate with uh, quite a few guys signing pro contracts over the past several years, but at the same time, not everybody on the team has that opportunity and not everybody wants to, to go that route. And so we try as much as we can to prepare them for what's next beyond, uh, beyond the, the soccer side. 
And so athletics or academics becomes the, the major player in that. Uh, we have an incredible uh, athletic support staff that works with all of our student athletes. Uh, each program has their own academic advisor that works with their specific athletes, um, as well as we have mentors that help uh, each one of our athletes and they help guide them through the, the process. As you're here as a freshman, they really kind of get you um, comfortable and familiar with the college lifestyle and, and get you uh, up to speed. And so you're not caught off guard. You're not behind in classes. They help you solve the different you know, study habits or help you keep a, a good schedule so that you're not falling behind in classes, uh, as well as we have uh, tutors, we have study hall, um, we have everything that any student could possibly need to make sure that you meet uh, your, your uh, progress towards degree and not just meet that, but you're, you're excelling in that. Um, you know, we have uh, our team uh, since I've been here since uh, 2014, I don't think that we've had a year that we've been below a 3.0 GPA. Uh, we've had semesters where we're above a 3.5. Uh, and so if you don't do well in school, it's not because you couldn't do it. It's because you're not applying yourself and you're not taking advantage of the resources that are available to you. So if you are here as a student athlete at the University of Memphis, you will have every need that you need uh, taken care of to make sure that you are successful in the classroom. That's great. Um, now, I know there's, ne there's never such thing as a typical week in, uh, in a soccer season, but, you know, tr let, let's try to assume for once that there might be, but what, what would that week look like from a student athlete's perspective during the season in terms of what they're doing when they get up, uh, meals, practice, traveling for games, that sort of thing. Just a rough, a rough overview. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure if you, you are aware of the, uh, legislation that is, is trying to be passed right now, right. uh, with the, with the men's side, yeah. uh, trying to go to a full year model. And if that passes, that it will be just one game a week. And for us, that would be, you know, a huge blessing uh, because, you know, there are, I don't want to sit here and preach about all the, the, the positives and the benefits that come to it. Uh, but if you're doing one game a week, you're playing games on, on Saturdays or Sundays. And, uh, and so nobody's missing class. Uh, and that's, that's the first and, and most important piece of it is, you're not having to, to miss any of your academics to, to play in games. Uh, so you're able to, to, we're able to go, uh, we'll play a game. Let's say, you know, the game is, is on a, um, on Saturday night, uh, on Sunday, we would, uh, we would either travel home or we'd stay here at home and we do a recovery session for the guys that played heavy minutes. For those that didn't, we would try to have a, uh, have a, uh, a, an intense session for them. Uh, and then Monday would be an off day. Uh, on Monday, you take that day to, you know, catch up on your academics, go grocery shopping, do all the different things that you find yourself piling up throughout the course of the week and, uh, and kind of get that off your plate. So you, you, you don't have to stress about it for, uh, for the rest of the week. Um, Tuesday, we would have a, uh, an AM lift session. Uh, that's uh, seven to 8 AM. Uh, then after that, uh, the, the guys would have their snacks, uh, get their shakes, stuff like that after they finish. Um, then they'd either go have their breakfast, uh, go to class, uh, be in class until roughly 1, 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, come over for, uh, for practice. We'll start practice between 2 and 2.30, and then we'll, we'll train roughly for an hour and a half. Uh, when we finish there, everybody's off. To, to go their own way. If you're a freshman, you would have some sort of study hall, mentors, um, you know, tutors, something like that to make sure that your, your mind is on your academics. Um, and then everybody else is, is free to kind of do what they need to, to, to make sure that they are um, keeping up their academics and, uh, and just making sure that they're not falling behind. Um, and then, you know, uh, on Wednesday, it would be uh, classes in the, in the morning, uh, early afternoon. And then same training schedule. Thursday would be the same schedule as, um, as Tuesday. Friday would be the same schedule as Wednesday. And then Saturday, uh, have a game. 
and then rinse and repeat the the following week okay um let's kind of talk a little bit then about the team and, and the soccer side of things so uh what what does the the soccer staff overall look like in terms of of how many folks what their roles are and how y'all work together to 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 help the, the players yeah we have uh we have an awesome staff i uh, love working with this group um richard has been here uh for nine years now uh nine or ten years i believe it is um he was an assistant here before um before he took over as the head coach uh he took over as head coach after his second year here and then uh when he took over the, as head coach i came uh, and joined him on staff uh i've been here now with him for going on our, uh, our eighth year together um as well as we have a second assistant, Chris Tadley, who came down from Lehigh University last year. Uh, he's been here. He'll be starting his second year with us this fall. And then uh, Remco Dejong, who has been here uh, longer than all of us have been here. Uh, he's the, the goalkeeper coach on, on staff, and he's been here uh, since the previous uh, administration. I want to say roughly mid-2000s. So he's got a long tenure of being here and helping uh, goalkeepers out. Um, he works specifically with the goalkeepers. He's a volunteer, so he's really only there uh, for training sessions, for games. And once or twice a year, he'll travel with us uh, to different games. Uh, but for the most part, he's only there to, to run uh, sessions with the goalkeepers as, uh, as needed. Chris is the second assistant. Uh, he has on-field coaching responsibilities uh, as well as um, – as in the uh, office, he'll work on a lot of the uh, video breakdowns, um, you know, travel schedules, uh, you know, a lot of administrative stuff that, uh, that needs to be taken care of. He does. Um, I'm the associate head coach. I basically run uh, most of, if not all of the training sessions. We all have input on those, uh, you know, coming up week to week on what we need to work on, how we need to strategize for opponents. And then I design the training sessions that are appropriate for us. And then um, I'll, I'll run the sessions with the help of the, uh, of the other coaches. Uh, I do uh, the majority of the recruiting, although both, if not all of the other coaches have recruiting responsibilities. Uh, any goalkeepers stuff that comes to me, I pass on to, uh, to Chris and to Remco to, to look through and give us their feedback on them. Um, and then when we're out, uh, on the road, uh, myself, Chris, Richard, we spend most of the, the time doing the, the recruiting, uh, out on the field. And then Richard, uh, he does a bit of everything. Um, he'll, he'll, uh, have a lot of input on the field, but he mostly, when we're training, we'll sit back, uh, and just kind of watch and analyze and evaluate the guys, what's going on, and then try to put everything together so that it makes sense and fits when we come to, um, come to the, uh, the team at the end of the week uh, that we want to select for, for game day. Uh, so everybody plays a major role. Everybody's got a lot of responsibilities. And it's just a, a, a group that, that we feel like functions very well together. Uh, Richard is a player's coach. He's a very nice guy. He's very easy to, to talk to and access. Um, but he does have, you know, when, when you've crossed the line or when it's not getting done the, the way he wants to, he'll let you know. Uh, so he's not afraid to, to speak up when and if he has to. Uh, I'm the hard coach. Uh, I hold the players accountable. Uh, you know, I, I do all the, the, the stuff that, you know, the, the other coaches uh, don't want to do as, as far to hold, as holding everybody accountable. Uh, Chris is the, uh, the go between the coaches and the, and the rest of the team. He's kind of closer to their age. Uh, and so he has, you know, kind of those, those types of mentor relationships with the boys. Uh, and so it's just, uh, it's, it's a group that we really like. We really enjoy working together. And so it's, it seemed to have worked in, uh, in, in created a very good uh, environment for us in the uh, office and on the road. No, uh, that's fantastic. And, and, ha and having met a couple of you, I would agree. Is this a good, it's just a good, uh, a good staff for sure. Well, you know, you kind of talked about a little bit on, on, the, the, the style of coaching there a little bit, but talk to me a little bit about what 
the style of play is, you know, obviously I'm not holding you to uh, telling me the formation that you have to play hundred percent of the time or anything like that, but, but just give me a, a, a general overview of, of, of how you guys like to play. Yeah, it's um, we've, we've certainly had to be evolving. Uh, we've got better teams in the, in the conference than we ever have before. We have some really great young coaches who they keep us on our toes. And so it's not something where we go into a, a season anymore um, thinking this is what our formation is going to be. This is what our lineup is going to be. This is how we're going to play every game. Uh, I think it's something that, that we've started to learn, uh, especially post-COVID, that we have to be more adaptable. We have to be able to change, uh, you know, from game to game. Not that that means we have to change our, our style as much. Uh, but it, it means that we've got to find different formations. There are different moments in the game that we do have to have to change in to meet the requirements of the opponent or the conditions or anything like that. Uh, and so these are things that, that sometimes we have to be very creative with, uh, scheming for different teams, creating different lineups, uh, styles, you know, different, uh, different ways that, that we can throw things at teams that they might not have been able to scout in the last game. And so sometimes you can be too creative for your own good. Um, and you have to really learn from those things. And sometimes you have to learn the lesson the hard way. And unfortunately we have learned that lesson the hard way sometimes. Um, but it's something where if we're going to sit here and say, this is how we want to play, we want to develop the game. We want to build the ball from the defensive third. We want to, you know, start a, a, you know, in to, to try to, you know, I'm um, trying to word it so that it's, it, it, I don't give too much away. <laughs> um, you know, we, I'll, I'll say we want to possess the ball. We want to build the ball through the different thirds. Um, but we want to do it in a way that it doesn't put us at a deficit. Uh, it doesn't put us at risk. Um, and sometimes that can be really fast. Sometimes it can be slow and methodical. Uh, but it's, it's something where we want to control the tempo of the game. And this is still something that is a work in progress for us. Uh, we're still trying to recover from, uh, from COVID and the changes that we've made within the program since then and trying to bring the right players that fit the system, fit the style, uh, and our players who they can be adaptable to the different situations and the changing situations game to game. Okay. No, that's fair enough. Um, well, coach, I really do appreciate the time. We've, we've covered a lot of different ground, talked about a lot of different things, but I like to end kind of uh, all these the same way, which is what didn't we talk about? What did we, what did we miss? What else do you want to let us know about either the school, the program or, or anything else you got on your mind? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, we, we did qu cover uh, quite a bit there. I think, you know, for, for recruits, uh, especially in post COVID era, uh, there's the, the recruiting landscape has changed and that's, that's a reality of, of things with the COVID years that have been granted to players who are here. Um, we're still probably two and three years away before that has kind of washed away. And now we've, we've equalized that. And so I think there's, there's still a lot of kids. There's a lot of parents who want to think things are the way that they always have been. And, you know, Hey, my, this kid signed a, a, um, or he committed to this school as a sophomore. He he committed to this school as a junior. Well, that doesn't necessarily happen as as much and as often anymore, uh, because of those those players who get that extra year. You have more players in uh, in the programs, and then on top of that, you have the introduction of the transfer portal, which it just throws another wrench into the uh, the machine. For, uh, for those kids who are trying to get recruited. And so now timelines for freshmen have gotten pushed further and further and further back uh, because when a season ends, now a team has really had its opportunity to go back and evaluate their players, evaluate their system and figure out, is this working? Um, are these the right players? Are these the right fits? And so while you go through those end of the year meetings uh, at, with coaches and with players, you start to have a lot of changes within the within the team. And when those changes occur, the first thing that you do to replace those players is you go to the transfer portal. And the big reason for that is because you get kids who have a year of college experience 
whether they played or whether they were just in a really high level environment. Now that is taken into account and maybe that kid is valued a little bit higher than a, you know, an all American high school soccer player. Uh, while they both have value, uh, it, it's, you know, not enough can be said for somebody who's already been in the, uh, the college game for a while. And, uh, and so you, you start to lose opportunities to them. And now again, once you go through the spring season, now teams are really kind of filling in the gaps, filling in the holes with, uh, with those other uh, players. And so the, the one thing I can't stress enough uh, to parents and players is patience and really, you know, spread a very wide net. Uh, don't get caught up in the glitz and the glamour of, you know, this team plays in this conference or they play this schedule. Uh, find a program, find a school that really fits you holistically. Uh, you know, do they play a style? You know, uh, how many subs do they make a game? Um, you know, what's the coaching styles of the, of the coaches? Those are all things that should be more important than the uniform that a team wears. It should be more important than, you know, the conference a team plays in, uh, and making sure that those are all the right fits for you as a player. And then that normally ends up, if you, you find that right fit, you don't end up having those lulls, uh, in your, in your progression and uh, it just leads for a happier experience for the individual and their coaches. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's, it's a great way to end it. Well, Coach, I do appreciate the time. We wish you guys the best of luck next season. Uh, we'll keep an eye on you, see how you guys are doing there in the American, and hopefully you can uh, bring home a conference championship. Uh, we'd, we'd love nothing more. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you so much for the time.